Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another Dynamic Leader Conversation. Gosh, how is it that time rolls around so quickly and it's like I'm barely keeping up and communication just doesn't stop and how on earth am I going to get through everything and take it all in, consume, consume, consume. Is there even enough time for sleep is what I think to myself sometimes. And I wonder if it's just me or if anyone else feels the same sense of this overwhelm in the work that they do or even in the lives that they live. And if so, I'm really happy to be sharing an amazing speaker with us today and author of eight books, Lynn Kazali, who is going to talk to us about her latest book called R, uh, which is a practical guide to outsmarting overwhelm. And outside of the writing, Lynn helps individuals, teams and organisations transition to new ways of working. Um, I've known Lynn for um, coming up, I think, over six years now um, and can absolutely attest to the inspiring work that she does. But thank you so much for joining us today, Lynn. Thank you. Thanks, Shelley. It's so good to see you and speak with you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so um, outside of, um, you know, I don't have enough time, um, I have found that one of the biggest challenges as a coach and as a, a trainer in the leadership space is leaders dealing with overwhelm this and it's in this reactive kind of way did you write this book for me and my clients <laughs> uh I think I wrote it for myself first like that isn't that what good books are supposed to be about is that it's it's been the author's journey you know and the author's struggle uh and really what I was discovering was the way that I used to be overwhelmed had changed and I wasn't as overwhelmed anymore and and, and I thought why is that what have I done and so when I unpacked what I'd done I thought oh this is there's something practical here that people could follow um, and so as I unpacked that and then found the research that was sitting behind the various elements of it I went oh yeah oh yeah this needs to be a book. And then COVID came along and I went, quick, get this, get this book out, quicker. You know, people really are really going to need it. Yeah. It's um, it's definitely timing um, makes, makes for a good release for a book. But um, I don't think there's ever been a time where I would say most of us have felt, even those that are quite resilient, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Because I think there are, you know, some people have in the workshops I've been running lately, seriously, there's been a few people said, look, I don't really get this overwhelm thing. Like, I don't really know what it is. And when it turns, you dig a bit further and they've got lots of people supporting them in their life and and they're not doing that much. You know, they do their job and that's it. But the kids are being taken care of or the house is being cleaned or <laughs> other emotional labours are being taken care of but most people could now say ah now I now I know what overwhelm is yeah uh, whether that emotional overwhelm of uh of you know the shock or surprise of information or you know the pressures of being locked down or the pressures of having to switch into remote learning mm. um remote work schooling your kids at home all of these things each one on its own would be mm. enough to oh. make people feel that rise of emotion. So yeah. we've had that layer upon layer upon layer. You um you actually you speak of the 40 <laughs> the 40 horrors. Um <laughs> and I and I kind of giggled a little bit as I was ticking them off. And I did, I, I ticked off the checkboxes. Your la your laptop or computer is freezing. Yep. Um slow Wi-Fi, screaming kids, being late for something, uh, waiting at the doctor's office being on hold, slow drivers, people cancelling on you, et cetera. And I was thinking, yeah, all of these things really do kind of give me that, you know, ah uh, moment. But in isolation, I sort of think, gosh, they're so small. Why, why do I let such a small thing have such a big impact? Why is that? I think we like uh, free progress. I think we like to make progress once we've decided on doing something and when something gets in the way that we weren't expecting like slow wi-fi or you know a computer freezing that is when we go i never planned that you know that that is not of my choosing and uh, my sense is that the the emotion can come a little quicker at times like that simply because we didn't choose it 
and we may not be able to remedy it straight away. Mm. Uh, and I think we can wonder, so take something like, I think Zoom froze globally yesterday for the first time uh, I've heard any outages over the last however long. So you can imagine a lot of people would have been going, oh, that, that's a horror for uh, so much that's being delivered online. And, yeah. and, and if it's out of our control, it wasn't of our choosing, I think that's a sure sign that overwhelms just just knocking on the door. Here it comes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So there's a there's a, a little bit that I highlighted in the book that I really like. You said you say that overwhelm isn't just one thing once. Um, mm. It's a complex mix of loads and emotions that, while vital for human functioning, can get out of control or start running our life. Um, and understanding that overwhelm is and what it's made up of will give us the power to redefine it Mm -hmm. to not fall victim to its powerful vortex which is definitely a vortex um, and to instead be the master of our own thoughts and emotions so is the idea that if we can understand overwhelm and how it's triggered and what and where and and when um, that we can take control of it and then be the master of our own destiny essentially Mm, yes I think we can label the things that do challenge us or if we've got too much on or things are really stressful or we're trying to take in lots of information and we just go, oh, I can't do it, I'm too overwhelmed. And it's that blanket statement, I'm overwhelmed, where I think we could just pause for a minute and go, what are you really? Maybe you're tired and maybe you're trying to do too much or you haven't had your lunch or you need a break or, you know, there could be a whole range of other things that have been piling up and maybe you've taken a lot of information in already so if we can understand and start to pick apart what is the thing the one of the main things you know what is one of the main things contributing to my overwhelm at the moment then yes I I believe we've got we've got the resources and the capability and I say to outsmart it saying Mm -hmm. aha I've got you I know (laughs) I know what's going on here I know why I'm reacting like this. In fact, I could do this instead. And so we kind of get smarter than our instant reaction or response. And you mentioned that, um, you know, it's the it's about taking a pause. And I think that's probably key to it, isn't it? How can I learn from my overwhelm or really understand it if I don't actually stop and, and reflect on what's causing it? How do, how do leaders do that today? Like even finding a few, a few minutes, how do you... Mm. How do they do that? Yes. So before, um, well, an example, but before meetings, uh, I, set, uh, I set a timer and an alarm on my uh, phone. So if I've got to be somewhere, like for our conversation today, my timer and alarm went off 15 minutes before. So I'm not racing <laughs> from one thing to the next. I make sure I get out of the previous thing so I've got a bit of time. And I even had some time to do a few little tasks, keeping my eye on where I had to be at what time, doing a few little things that would only take uh, a minute here and 30 seconds there and two minutes there. And I had some breathing space, some time to get ready for our conversation. And then after this, I need to have another little window of time. And uh, from the research I was looking at, you know, 60 to 90 seconds can be enough to empty your cognitive load so empty the information and weight that you've been carrying throughout a meeting or throughout listening to a podcast Mm. is to then empty that and it and it commits some of it to long-term memory and otherwise your brain sort of sorts and synthesizes and tosses the rest out and if you don't take that break you keep piling and piling and piling on And that's why we feel like zombies at the end of the day. So all I'm doing is slotting in a little break. Yes, sounds generous with 15 minutes, but even something as short as 60 or 90 seconds can can help prepare you for the next thing. That is so powerful because I know one of the things that my listeners will be sort of asking themselves is where am I going to get an extra 15 minutes, you know, in between my back-to-back meetings. Um, And I think a lot of leaders are... um, are ruled by the calendar and not the other way around. And I think there's some work that can be done there, but even just um, leaving a meeting a couple of minutes 
before the end time, if you do have a back to back, that you allow two minutes to just sit in quiet and and let everything sort of consolidate before you move into the next. It's really good for managing their state and how they show up as well, isn't it? Yes, absolutely it is. So as you say, you could just say, okay, folks, got to go if you have to slip out of the meeting. Um, Like good leaders in these times are finishing meetings early. So in, say, some of the training sessions I'm running, if it's to finish it half on the hour, try and finish it at 25 past. So you're giving people time to go to the bathroom, get a drink, go outside, pat the dog. Stand (laughs) up. Stand up. This is the thing, change the state, interact with the family. Yeah. Uh, not not stay where you are and keep checking emails. To get up, break the state, uh, and as Seth Godin says, it's like we've got a truck here that we're carrying around information and it's our truck in our mind is full yeah. and we need to empty it and that's what that short break uh, is doing. That's great. I love it. Mm. Um, so my other question around um, overwhelm, and this probably is quite personal because I... Uh, like to create my own chaos because I work most effectively when there's shit everywhere and (laughs) lots of stuff going on. I seem to get things done. I seem to procrastinate and stall on things when there's not enough going on. Um, But I understand that there's a very fine line between using that for motivating purposes and becoming completely overwhelmed and stressed. And I don't know that I've quite mastered that even after a couple of decades in the workforce. <laughs> Is that something that you have? Um, what have As I in mastered? A like, is there a, is there something about because I'm I'm I know I'm not the only one that likes to work in in chaos, but yeah, yeah. So if it's chaos of pressure versus chaos of a messy desk I invite chaos of a messy desk you know it's been a sign of creativity and you have happy collisions where bits of paper touch each other that weren't supposed to and interesting things happen but chaos of the mind is is a a sure sign of overwhelm we might be juggling uh, too much work at once so some of the research around both multitasking and task switching. So uh, juggling too many things at once, uh, it, it makes us what I call, you know, dumb and dumber, Lowers can lower our IQ to that of an eight-year-old. And that meeting that you think is really boring, well, of course it's boring. If I was an eight-year-old, what eight-year-old wants to be in some boring about, you know, workforce strategy and allocation of resources and um, so we kind of owe it to ourselves and to our colleagues to not be multitasking so that we're bringing our smarts, you know, to the call. But on the topic of procrastination, that can, I mean, that's got a whole other body of research behind it, but it can be about um, not, not having defined what the end point is. So I don't know what this thing's going to look like. Mm. Um, so it can be tough to start because I don't know where to start. But if I knew if I knew what I was going for, software developers called the definition of done. If I knew what the definition of done was, I could get started because I know when I reach it, mm. it will be done versus perfectionism, which is just a naughty school friend of procrastination. They hang around together and they cause problems. They egg each other on. Uh, and so procrastination it, we don't start and then perfectionism we don't stop we we keep you know keep going and going and going with the task so I think they both have a connection to Mm. um, overwhelm and perfectionism in particular that we can be going Mm. for these you know invisible uh, invisibly high standards so the mastery you talk about I reckon that's about defining what Mm. what am I actually working on here and Mm. when will it be done Oh, I love the definition of done. done. I definitely am not um, a perfectionist. I'm more of a what else can I fit in my life right now <laughs> that I can achieve? <laughs> it's more of an excitement. Let's yes. get everything okay. done now. And um, and it motivates me, like the energy behind the, oh, so much going mm-hmm. on. That's so exciting. Let's, let's yes. just go, 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 go. Stimulation. Yes. yes. Yeah. Is that the then really can quickly go I'm burnt out (laughs) 
yes, well, this is the, uh, the longer term problems of how overload and overwhelm isn't sustainable. Uh, and it could just start as something like migraines or insomnia or some aches and pains. And then over time, you know, moods and irritability and, uh, and then, you know, disinterest in various tasks that you used to find interesting uh, can be some of those, those signs that you, you used to like that bit of your job, but ugh, you don't anymore. You know, oh, there's, a, mm, there's some sort of niggly thing starting to, to come in there. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, overload and overwhelm. Uh, you're on the path to to burnout, and mm. it's the Harvard Business Review put out a, a special edition research on burnout just a couple of um, what was in about June, May or June of 2021, and a fantastic, shocking but fantastic summary about how the the world as it is now and and how we're burning ourselves. Yeah. Mm, okay victim number one of that must read that mm. article we'll um i'll squirrel that away for later uh, yeah i know what you're doing there <laughs> tell us tell us about that tell because uh, I, I read that and giggled and i was like oh i've got a whole folder of stuff that i've squirreled away for winter <laughs> yes you know the little the little uh squirrels who say they're nuts and hoard things i think we can be great squirrelers of information and we when we were at conferences, we'd grab screenshots of things that the speaker was presenting. Oh, I might need that later. Oh, I might need that later. Uh, and we're doing it now. We do screenshots. Oh, I better grab that and store it where? I don't know. Uh, so we can have thousands and thousands of these screenshots that we never go back to. And to me, that is it's highly inefficient because it's reworking information you've already been in the moment with and if you say I will do that later you've then got to kind of recreate that context you were in to be able to remake sense of that information distill it again integrate it synthesize it store it in short-term memory into long-term memory and that's a huge drain on our mental resources it's much better to make sense of what you're seeing in the moment mm. and instead of screenshotting the we don't re we don't retain that as well as if we just imagined click click taking a photo with our eyes if we imagine taking a photo we have greater recall than if we actually do take a photo or screenshot it's so that's so true like um i think one of the reasons why it continues to be put off and put off and put oh yeah i'll get to that yep i need to look at that i need to look at that is mm. the that we do have to recreate the context and the event and the environment mm. and that is quite energy consuming but equally when we're not doing anything with it it's still consuming energy yes. isn't it yes yeah i call that like an open loop in your head it's like a, a tab in your brain's browser that's open that information is unresolved mm. uh, it hasn't been distilled synthesized integrated and either stored or deleted mm. and so it's still sitting there uh, unfinished and taking on that yeah, mental burden ah that's a that's a thing I've still got to do I've still got to do this and this and this and this and every time we run through those things you know there's more energy I'm devoting to remembering what I haven't done and mm. oh I should have done that berating myself over it and and that contributes to overwhelm as well yeah yeah there's emotional turmoil there and mm. there's uh, energy and and I was reading I think our blood pressure goes up when we look down a to-do list <laughs> the longer as you as you look down 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 your to-do list and you see more and more things on there um, yeah, some of that research was was uh, gave me a little bit of a laugh, but I also thought, oh, it's not good if we look at our to do list and our blood pressure rises, and all the stuff that we haven't done but would like to have done. And so, is this where you give yourself permission to um, trade in your nuts? If we're going to use a squirreling <laughs> analogy, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a good name for a book: trading your nuts. <laughs> <laughs> like if I on my to-do list, what of this mm. is what I've squirreled away and that I can just cross off and mm. free up some space. I think the 
I like a to-do list and I don't, I don't religiously live by a to-do list, but I like a to-do list to get stuff out of my head if I am feeling yes. a little bit overloaded, um, just to go what's in there, get it out, and then I can do something with it. And a lot of the time yeah. it is, that's not important anymore, cross yes. that off. It, yeah. and, and there's benefit in that. Yeah, yeah. And that's that action you've talked about is called externalising. So it's get what is in your head out. It doesn't matter in what form. Um, but some of the data around the efficiency of to-do lists is they don't allow time for us to explain in more detail what the tasks are or when it might be due yeah. or how much time I think it's going to take. So yeah. um, apps like Trello, Asana and Monday and uh, programs or, or processes like Kanban, uh, K-A-N-B-A-N, have been shown to be way more productive where we thinly slice the work that we have to do, not put it as one big lump on our to-do list. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. It um, it can definitely paralyze people from getting oh, yeah. started. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, that could be the link back to procrastination. Oh, I've got to start that, but it looks like such a big task. Yeah. Don't I'll know do something else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me, um, for leaders who are feeling overwhelmed, I noticed that a lot of the time it is through behavior that they have created or um, behavior that they have tolerated mm-hmm. over time. And that sometimes it's about actually shifting how they work to be able to then manage it. Like a a lot of them, they've got so much going on and it's all valid in their own mind, but a lot of it is actually not things that they should even be looking at, touching, that they've, they're have they getting too involved in things that they should just really empower and let their teams mm. run with. Is Are you seeing similar kind of things? Yeah, definitely. Definitely with the adoption of new ways of working and agile ways of working, these what I call better ways of working is that the way we are working, and so people might like to think about this, the way you're working, where did you learn that from? And you likely learned it from a previous leader or manager or combination of places you've previously worked mm. or you observed some other people <laughs> and learned from there. So the the shocking thing is there are new and better ways to do lots of the things we're doing which were designed in a very industrialized time and now a lot of us working with information uh, working much more closely with other other people and humans uh, there are some smarter cleverer hacks shortcuts and the smart uh, ways that make us more productive it's easier on our brain mm. and it means that the work we get done uh, we can work on the most if we can work on the most valuable tasks mm. uh, we make better progress so if you have got a lot on um, it could be worth playing that 80 20 Pareto effect and go okay what's the 20 percent of this stuff that if I did it would bring a huge 80 percent return versus faffing about with the 80 percent it might feel good or feel busy but when it's not really delivering as much it might only be delivering 20 percent of of the progress or outcomes or value so working on the highest value tasks that's the that's the thing to do absolutely agree with that and i think the first thing that people could that leaders could um cross off their list of obliging things to do is responding to emails that they have only been cc'd in yes yes that's right that would be a good one uh, and and it's a, a good thing to to look at that to-do list we we're talking about before and and ask now how did that task get there did <laughs> someone drop that onto my list or did i ignore that and it snuck on or did I put it there? Or maybe I've got no idea. I don't know where it came from, but someone said I had to do it. So as you said before, you can cross things off that um, that aren't needed. 
Um, mm. Or a, a technique I heard some years ago was called calculated neglect. That is, I'm deliberately not going to do that and just watch. I bet it slides right off the list and never needs to be done. Yes, you completely ignore it. <laughs> yeah. On purpose. Yeah, calculated. I'm deliberately not doing that. I don't know. Maybe someone does need it, but I'm not seeing the value in it right now. Yes. It's so interesting. Um, I had an urgent message that came through yesterday and I sort of saw it out of the corner of my eye when I was in a meeting with someone and, and I I thought, you know what, I'm actually, I'm just not going to respond just for a couple of minutes. But, Mm. and then there was another message that came through about five minutes later saying, ignore my last message. It's okay. I sorted it. Um, (laughs) And so sometimes I think it's that it is that deliberate. I'm not touching you right now. because mm. it can't possibly mm. I don't I don't work in emergency services there can't possibly be anything that can't hold for five or ten or even half an hour um, and it's giving permission to myself to go it'll be okay it feels yeah. it makes me feel a little bit anxious sometimes like gosh how's this going to reflect but so many things just resolve themselves which means I don't get taken away from my task and um, I yeah, I don't feel overwhelmed by that. So there's all mm. these little things, isn't there? Yeah. So these are the hacks and shortcuts and newer ways of working that mm. that I've learned from the agile working in with agile teams, software development teams over the last 10, 15 years or so. And then putting these practices in place in my way of working in my world. And so focusing uninterrupted has been shown to be the number one productivity tool. Mm. And we are, yeah, we're hugely distractible people. Oh, look, a kitten, you know, we we just look. (laughs) Oh, oh, that, oh, wow. Oh, that's interesting. Um, So check out who distracts you and what you get distracted by and in what situation are you being distracted? Perhaps the task, again, was too big. Yes. And you, you got to a point where you went, oh, this is hard, and boom, there's the distraction. I'll empty the dishwasher instead. <laughs> Mind you, we know also that boring tasks, repetitive tasks are huge for um, creative breakthroughs. So oh, yes, you know, of doing course. a repetitive thing when you are stuck on a problem can be yet another one of these deliberate hacks. Mm. I, I can't solve this problem. I know what I'll do. I'll go and empty the dishwasher and boom, in comes an idea or solution. Yeah. Folding laundry every time. Yes. yes. Yep. 100%. Yep. Totally agree with that one. Tell us about the, the three um, things that we can do to ultimately outsmart overwhelm. You talk about redefine, reimagine, redirect. T- tell us about, they look really cool. <laughs> so redefining overwhelm. So instead of going, oh, so overwhelmed what we talked about before which is to uh, identify what's really going on and I think it happens at the levels of emotion and workload and Mm -hmm. information and they can all bundle up and it can be really messy so if you can redefine what's going on instead of the generic I'm overwhelmed you're part of the way there to to getting it sorted the second thing to do is um, to redefine at work which is what we've been talking about that we can work in new and better and different ways Uh, we don't have to switch this on overnight and everything changes no we might just change one or two things like managing distractions Mm -hmm. or um, you know not switching our focus so much um, and then the, the third thing we need to do is really give, uh, I guess, discerning focus onto information. When you are needing to take in, say, a presentation or read some important stuff, is to give yourself that focus time and allow your brain to do that work of absorbing, synthesizing, processing, sense making. And, and really try to keep focused on that. And then once you finish the reading, woohoo, go crazy. Release the pressure of um, that focused uh, intention you've had there. Uh, mm. That's one of the best ways to deal with information uh, so you don't get overloaded by that and overloaded by work and overloaded by emotions. Yes, it's the compounding effect. Um, mm. And I think that, you know, if we talk about, lockdown homeschooling trying to run a business 
trying to keep the house clean when little people see no value in it, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. High, um, high emotion as well as I think high workload mm. and still trying to take everything in. Um, what I struggle with and what I've been struggling with over the past week or so is the lack of control that I have over this situation. And I know that this is not the only time I've had lack of control, but it feels quite extreme as well as mm. the lack of time frame that mm. we could still be here in hopefully not 2022. <laughs> mm. But how do you how do you deal with the emotion that comes with that the that emotion around the unknown and like this mm. is you know when you're thinking about when we work in agile environments it is all about the unknown. Um, mm. There's mm. some ways that you know me more than anyone else because you know I'm <laughs> feeling it at the moment. What can you do with that? Yeah, um, I think we can learn some great lessons from some people who are really good at uncertainty uh, and watch what they do and and learn from them and they are improvisers who perform on stage with no script and potentially you know many of the in every city around the world there'll be an improv troupe who pre-covid were putting on performances on stages during covid they're still doing it but they're doing it online so uh, go along. They're doing courses in Melbourne. Impro Melbourne uh, is is running courses online. But the thing about improvisers is, they stand on stage or they are online in a group, and they may not know the other performers. So there's uncertainty number one. <laughs> and then uh, often they'll get suggestions from the audience. You know, give me the name of a a profession, give me a city, and give me someone's name. And so you end up with these three things and boom, they then start a scene based on these three markers, really, a city, a, a profession and someone's name. And they didn't know what was going to come from the audience. They don't know where this scene is going, but they wholeheartedly throw themselves into it. And the way they do that is to follow a range of improv principles. So if we follow the improv principles, uh, and it's a muscle to learn and to strengthen called spontaneity, the more we're able to handle and go with what's happening versus fighting and blocking what's happening, the more comfortable we feel with uncertainty. Right. So I think every leader needs to get not get comfortable with discomfort, but because <laughs> how do you do that? Uh, but get some spontaneity training and you will trust your brain a lot more. You'll, you'll trust what you're able to provide you know, in the moment, in wow. the spur of the moment, flying by the seat of your pants instead of thinking, hey, everything's got to be perfect and controlled mm. or you know, I'll look foolish. Not the case. Love it. Not the case. So spontaneity training, never heard of it ever. <laughs> Love the idea of it. And even if, it only serves to distract me. <laughs> <laughs> but in a good way, right? In a because, good way. Yeah, the improv improvisers have, uh, you know, have a look at the Improv Encyclopedia or have a look at Hoopla Improv in the UK. Yeah. And there are plenty of games that they have there and they're not cheesy, corny icebreakers. They're games that help you build things like courage, communication skills, you know, empathy, connection, listening. And these are, these are useful, powerful skills for today. Uh, and in there you will find, uh, you know, in, embedded under most of those activities, there will be spontaneity skills that are helping you deal with uncertainty. That is awesome. That's uh, <laughs> definitely a takeaway for me. And I'm sure, <laughs> right. sure I'm not the only one who's um, in that position. I've got one more question for you, Lynn. Mm. Is overwhelm a little bit like managing time in that, it's, you know, I find, and I know there's other people that find that you can be really, really good at managing your time. Like you can be on it, you know, everything's prioritized and you're not wasting a minute and you, you're doing all the right things. And then something happens and everything turns to shit and <laughs> you're just all over the place. Is overwhelm a little bit like that? Do you still get caught in the overwhelm trap? Yes. 
Yeah, for sure. I think it's it's the rising emotion. And so we can have good things as well. I've been crying at news stories on TV about cats and dogs and uh, you know all sorts of stories that that bring rise to those emotions that are quite you know close to the surface in these times. Um, so I like to think uh, and and have learned from counselling and psychological support that some days are better than others. And I will feel better on some days. I even shorten it and say some mornings are better than others. <laughs> some hours are better than others. Um, right. And to not expect um, and hi to Pip, my uh, counsellor, if she's listening, <laughs> to not expect that we are always going to be on. Like some days we feel like shit and we, we kind of, either write the day off or do something that we know will be good for us or good for, you know, make us feel better and then have a crack tomorrow, <laughs> you know, have another go have another at it day. tomorrow. And uh, I talk about this in the book that overnight when you sleep, your brain is doing an incredible amount of housekeeping. It's consolidating information. It's taking out the trash. It's recycling. It's storing things. Mm. And you get the chance to start again tomorrow with your, you know, clean slate and mm. see how you go tomorrow with emotions and workload and information. And emotions might have got you today, but it could be information that gets you tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and I yeah, what I, I what I love about our conversation is it's it really is about awareness. It's about being easy on ourselves and not putting too much pressure on what we can achieve and you know we're just human at the end of the day so mm. I think we've got to allow ourselves mm. to be yeah definitely that's one of the um, types of perfectionism that was on the rise um, where we hold high standards for ourselves um, so that's that's where that can kick in oh you know I'm angry at myself that I couldn't make you know that I couldn't perform at the level I did yesterday but consistently mm. every day like a robot no nah. Not possible. You, not possible. You, not possible. Not possible. I love it. Make apologies for it. I am human. That is fine. Yes. <laughs> yes. Applause for it. Applause for being human. And one of the underlying um, uh, biases or effects, the pratfall effect, which says that if you make an error, people actually perceive you more highly. So yes. it, all these times when we're trying to cover up errors or not, you know, not show vulnerabilities, if we do show a vulnerability, uh, our, the perception of us actually lifts. So uh, I've, I feel like that releases lots of pressure. I'm allowed to let a few pratfalls happen. Yeah. I'm allowed to let spell me. that word wrong. I don't care. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Uh, Lynn, it's been such a great conversation. Thank you so much for sharing some insights around your book. It's a really, um, for anyone who's interested in getting a copy, it's a really easy, it's a really easy read um, and super um, simple concepts to apply. And I think um, you'd almost read it and then pass the book on to someone else. It's Yes. Lovely, lovely gift. Gold. That's a great idea. Um, so I'll put a link to where people can buy a copy of their book and I'll also put a link to where they can connect with you as well, Lynn. But thank you so much thank for you. having the conversation. Thank you, Shelley. Thanks for the invitation and, uh, and to speak to everyone. Thank you. Thanks. And for everyone else listening, I look forward to another Dynamic Leader conversation with you very soon. Bye.